Hello. Hello. Welcome to Girl Scouts of the Desert Southwest presentation on six parts of a Girl Scout meeting. My name is Maria Ellers. I'm the membership director with the council and I want to give you a little background on myself. I was a Girl Scout starting in second grade because in my day you couldn't be a Girl Scout any younger than that. I went all the way through my senior year in high school. Then I became a troop leader for about a year and then I sort of dropped out uh, for about 10 years until I had my own daughter and she was old enough to become a Daisy Girl Scout. I was then a volunteer for a number of years through her fifth grade and I became a staff person with the council. The reason I tell you all this is that I've been to quite a few Girl Scout meetings in my time, both as a girl and as an adult. So this is why I asked to do this presentation for you. I train a lot of new leaders and I see the same kinds of struggles that you have. Even experienced leaders may not know all the tips and tricks to help them have a more efficient meeting. We're all concerned about using our time well. We want to have a big impact on the girls, but we don't want to feel like we're wasting our time and just keeping them um, working on busy work. We want to know that we're making a difference in their lives. So, I have a uh, process for you. It's recommended by GSUSA, and I'm here to tell you it does work. And in the end, we want you to have as much fun as the girls. Are you ready to be one of those amazing leaders who impacts the lives of your girl? Even a creative girl-led experience needs structure to it. The structure of the meeting is what makes the impact. You want to go from a pile of possibilities with your girls to having a finished project that is effective and meaningful. You're the one who shows the girls how to be a leader. By observing you, the girls are going to learn to do new things, even if it's outside their comfort zone. This means that sometimes you're going to be doing things outside your comfort zone. Being a troop leader might be one of those things. It's okay to let the kids know that. They need to know that adults also are learning and growing and that even though you might be a little nervous or uncomfortable or uncertain about something, you're still going to try it because that sets the example for them. They'll learn to think about others' points of view because you'll be talking to them from your point of view and you'll help them to understand. They'll grow into the girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. That's our mission. The key to all of this is planning your troop meetings. Keeping to this simple system will make it foolproof. Follow the Girl Scout motto and be prepared. Every troop meeting has six basic parts. The pre-meeting, the opening, business, activity, cleanup, and closing. It could be longer than an hour. This is set to a clock face to show you how it would be broken down if it was a minimum of one hour. We really don't recommend trying to do a shorter troop meeting. There are so many parts to it that are important. You add or take away time from the main activity time. The little other five parts of the meeting, really you cannot change the time much on them. They are going to take five minutes or ten minutes or whatever they take every time. So keep that in mind when you're setting the length of your troop meeting. If you add or subtract from an hour, that's time you're adding or subtracting from the main activity. Before the meeting, Good troop leaders arrive a little bit before the girls are expected. This gives you a chance to prepare the meeting space and greet the girls as they all arrive together and ready to pay attention. Oh, wait. The girls probably are not going to arrive all at the same time. And they're probably not going to be ready to focus on the troop meeting. So to keep them engaged and well behaved, you should have a pre-meeting activity. A 
pre-meeting activity should be self-directed. Girls should be able to work on the activity without too much in the way of directions. And as new girls come in, the ones that are already there should be able to tell them how to do it. It should be easy to clean up. This is not the main activity. You don't want to put a lot of preparation or clean up time into it. It should be safe, even for the most awkward kids. This is not the time to leave the brownies with hot glue or an entire bottle of glitter or give the daisies finger paints. Some things are just not worth the mess. And it should also be either free or really low cost. Using leftover materials or something on paper that's really cheap to print or even something reusable like a chalkboard or, or a whiteboard. The best pre-meeting activity also ties into either Girl Scouts or the theme of your main meeting. This will reinforce what you're trying to teach them. Here's some ideas for pre-meeting activities. It could be coloring pages or puzzles or games, classic board games, sidewalk chalk, giving them um, equipment to do simple outdoor games like hopscotch or foursquare, printing the lyrics to a Girl Scout song and have someone that teaches it and just is willing to sit there and sing it over and over as the girls come in, setting out an item from the recycling bin and challenging the girls to come up with five ways to use it. So it doesn't have to be something they create. It could be something they think about for a few minutes or brainstorm on or a puzzle they're working on. Start your meeting on time, even if everyone's not there yet. This is really important. They could be having a lot of fun with that pre-meeting activity. They could be really bonding with each other, sharing secrets, talking to each other. And sometimes it's hard to interrupt them because they are having a good time. But it's really important that you start on time. They're having a great time, but starting on time will teach the parents to respect your meeting time. That's often a bigger issue. Parents who are casual about what time the meeting starts or what time it finishes, they make your job harder. So if you start on time and end on time, you'll teach them that if they want their daughter to participate fully, they better get their act together. So how do you get a room full of girls to focus on the meeting? You need an opening. I thought this was a cute little picture. I wanted to point out, you don't always have to have a full-size flag to do a flag ceremony within a troop meeting. I've seen many troops use these little handheld flags and still go through the same process and, and steps and teach the girls how to do a flag ceremony. The meeting opening should be an attention getter. It's a way to gather the girls together even if they're all distracted and all over the room doing something. And it should be consistent. You want to use the same opening week after week because this is what trains the girls and families to pay attention. Make it part of the troop caper system. Whatever method you use to choose girls for jobs during the meeting should also be used for the opening. This gives girls another chance to lead. And if you're sitting there wondering, what the heck is a troop caper system, stay tuned. The opening should be short. It shouldn't take more than five or six minutes. This is where you really set the tone of the meeting and you want to be welcoming to everybody. So here's a side note on capers. A caper system is just a way to assign jobs. You often see them in elementary school classrooms and libraries. If it's a chart, then it's called a caper chart. Other times it's a physical system in which you move pieces around. The best caper systems are flexible because you don't know if girls are going to be absent or if they're going to bring in a couple of friends that are wanting to join the troop and you want to include those girls. So look for something simple like this. It's a chart and each girl has a clothespin with her name on it and they get moved around physically from week to week. The leader will perhaps pull them all off, throw them into a pile and randomly pick them and stick them back on the chart in order so that there's no worry about um, how to rotate them. 
here's another one where it's a variation on that. They took a coffee can, put the jobs around the outside, and everybody's name gets clipped on in, in a random order. There's some amazing looking caper charts that are not very functional. You'll see a lot of these on Pinterest. I notice in particular daisy leaders seem to get very enthusiastic about making fancy elaborate charts involving lots of flower themes. But there's problems with these. The one on the left, the flowers that are used for each girl are huge and it's really hard to effectively put more than one girl into each job pocket. So this is using the, the what they call the library pocket system. And it's not a bad system because normally you can put more than one girl into it. But this particular design, they got a little carried away with the size of the flowers. And so they really can only have one girl do each job. And you notice at the bottom, there's a bunch of girls that don't have anything to do. And that's not good. The one on the right, they have room to put more than one flower in each pocket, but the other drawback to this design is that there's a set number of jobs. And what if you're doing something different this week and you want a chance to be able to give them a new job that they haven't done before? There's no way to add it to this chart spontaneously. So just some things to think about. Here's a couple of flexible designs. The one on the left is actually my all-time favorite. I was taught to call it do it and did it. Basically it's two containers, one labeled do it and one labeled did it or done that, and the girls names are on popsicle sticks. They're all inside the first container, and as soon as you need anybody to do anything you just randomly reach in and grab a name and call out that name. This is great because it's very flexible, you can add a girl easily, if someone's not there you can draw another name. And the best part in the girls' minds is that they know that it's a random choice, that you're not playing favorites and you're not picking on them if you ask them to do something they don't want to do. That can be really important to a child. The one on the right's not bad either because it's at least flexible. There's a chance to move girls around and group them in different ways with the jobs. And if you notice, they have a section for cleanup to remind the girls that there's cleanup, but they don't have room to put the girls' names there because when it comes time for cleanup in this troop, they want everybody to do it. So it's on there to remind them, but it's showing that everybody's going to do cleanup. So back to openings. Brownies have a classic meeting opening that goes way back to their beginning. You say the brownie ring rhyme over and over as you walk around the room. You take the hand of a girl and she takes the hand of the next girl and the chain grows until everybody's apart. So the rhyme goes around and round and round about. Take the hand of a brownie girl scout. You say that over and over as the chain forms. When the last girl joins the chain, you form it into a circle and everybody finishes the rhyme one last time. Around and round and round about take the hand of a brownie girl scout. Here we are in a brownie ring ready for almost anything. And like I said this is a very old brownie opening. The kids actually really like it. I've used it even within the last couple of years and that age group they still like the rhyming quality, they like holding hands, they like the chain effect that they form. It's just a lot of fun. Here's more ideas for opening any troop meeting. Have a girl stand where you want the room for a circle, you know, where you want to form an opening circle. She can sing a song that the troop likes, and when they hear somebody singing that song, they know to stop and join the song and join the circle. Or have a pleasant sounding bell that a girl rings, and when they hear that bell, they form the circle. You can use a rhythmic clapping pattern. You'll hear teachers do this sometimes in classrooms because it helps kids to hear it above the sound of their classmates. And you just do the clapping pattern and the kids do the clapping pattern and they all come together. Have some girls prepared to do a flag ceremony. Then you use the quiet sign to get attention. The quiet sign is when an adult raises their hand. If a girl raises her hand, 
it's a girl asking a question. But if an adult raises her hand, the girls need to learn that that means the quiet sign and what they're supposed to do is everybody raises their hand and stops talking and pays attention. It works wonderfully well once the kids are trained and I've seen it work literally in a room with hundreds of girls in it. Then the girls can post the flags during the flag ceremony. After each of these openings, have the girls that are leading the group lead the promise and law. Saying it at every meeting like this is what's going to teach the children the words first, and then once they know the words, they'll start learning the meanings as they grow older. So now you have everyone's attention. Everyone's happy to be there with you and they're ready to focus. They know the meeting's going to start. There's some important things that you want to tell them. Some of the things are things you might have gotten at the service unit meeting or things that you saw on the council website and you want to share it with your troop. Some of these things will need brainstorming or group discussion. It's almost time for the fun part of the meeting, but first the girls need to take care of business. Talking about troop business teaches girls a lot of things. It teaches them goal setting, discussion skills, how to compromise, how to present your ideas, how to make decisions about opportunities, how to find resources. For daisies and first year brownies, the business portion of the meeting should not be more than 10 minutes. That's about all their attention span can handle. They want to get on to the fun part. For girls older than that, the business portion can last longer if it's girl-led. The age of the girls and the size of the group determine how business is discussed. Because you want full participation. You want every girl to participate, but if you've got a big crowd or if you've got very young girls, you have to think about these factors. Younger girls and small groups can just meet all together. In this setting, you're teaching them to respect whoever is speaking and to take turns. Younger girls can learn to respect the person speaking if that person's holding a special object. A Girl Scout tradition is to decorate a wooden stick and call it a talking stick. This is actually a very old Native American tradition. So often the sticks are decorated with yarn and feathers and maybe a little bell on it. Whoever's holding the stick is the only one that's allowed to be talking and then they pass it around. You can also use this very effectively with a stuffed animal. The point is that whoever is holding the stick is talking, but they also have a limited amount of time. They're not allowed to just keep talking. They only have a minute or two to express themselves, and then they're expected to pass it along. Older girls and bigger groups need to learn about forms of group governance. These girls can learn a consensus method for groups called fist to five. The directions are in the agent of change journey. That's a junior level journey. If you have access to the volunteer toolkit, I believe the directions are uh, loaded into the toolkit. This age of girls can also break into smaller groups of four to seven girls called a patrol. Don't make them any smaller than four girls and try not to make them any bigger than seven. The odd number works well, so they don't get tied if they're voting on something. If you get into too many girls, they don't have a chance to still have that personal input. Each patrol discusses their ideas separately, and then they send a representative before the whole troop to pitch their ideas or to vote for them. Look in the Girl's Guide to Girl Scouting for your age level to get more ideas on troop management. Also in Volunteer Essentials, there's a section on troop management. So what kind of business could a troop have to discuss? Attendance, collecting dues if your troop has dues, reviewing the bank account should be a routine part. The girls should be hearing about what's in the bank account and what it's spent on so they know what they have to work with. Planning the calendar. They can do that with you in the volunteer toolkit or you can do it on a paper calendar and then you transfer it later into the toolkit. 
reviewing honor troop requirements is something that you should do periodically throughout the year. Choosing field trips, choosing badges, choosing journeys, choosing take action projects. These are all girl-led activities. Discussing product sales, not just the training portion, but touching base during the sale to see how each girl is doing. Paperwork related to any of these things can be done as a group and the girls need to learn how to fill out paperwork because that's a big part of life, isn't it? Creating or updating the group agreement. This is built into many of the journeys and if you need more information, contact your local staff person to help you understand the best way to do this or look for further trainings that we do. Now that the business is out of the way, it's finally time for the main activity. I just love this picture. I love the look of horror and excitement on the different girls' faces. This is a Girl Scout meeting they are not going to forget. The main activity should be fun with a purpose. You know that Girl Scouts has a serious purpose, but the girls are there to have fun. They're not there to go to school. They're not there to do worksheets. It should be girl-led. This means that whatever you do, the adults should be asking questions, not just giving directions. Let the girls make lots of decisions and help them see how to figure things out. We do a lot of things in our heads automatically, but the kids still need to learn how to go through those steps. It should be hands-on. Kids sit a lot in school, and this is not school. So anytime you can get them up on their feet and moving around, all the better. It should be cooperative. Group projects and discussions are teaching them critical skills for getting through life. Girl Scout journeys and badges are already designed to be all of these things. That's the huge benefit in using the Girl Scout program. You can adjust the requirements on a badge to fit your resources. What's important is the skill that the badge is teaching, not the exact activity. Use the journey ideas as the starting point and then add non-Girl Scout ideas that match the theme. And if a girl has an idea that seems a little outrageous, don't just say no to her. Ask her questions to help her see what won't work or to see how to work towards her idea. A final note on your main activity. Take time with the girls to reflect on what they just did. This is a really important part of learning for kids and for adults. But taking just a moment to ask, you know, what was the best part of what we just did? Or what would you do differently next time? Can get them to stop and think about what they've learned and it'll make a bigger impression, even on a simple activity. So you're probably wondering about snacks. This is a big topic and um, it can be a worrisome issue for a lot of new volunteers. Snacks can be really important if the girls are coming right after school or if they're coming at a time when it's, for instance, an hour before normal dinner time. Snack time comes out of the main activity time, so you need to keep it short and simple. You should agree on healthy snacks. This can be part of your group agreement discussion, and once you do agree, maybe write it down and send it home so the parents are aware of it. If you have a system of parents bringing in the snacks, you sure want them to know what are good choices. If you give the kids sweets during the meeting time, it might be fast and easy to buy them some little prepackaged snack cakes, but believe me, you're going to regret it. Once they've got a lot of sugar in their system, they're going to get more hyper, more distractible. It's going to make your meeting more difficult. So giving them something with protein, something with less sugar, will go a long way toward keeping them focused. That includes drinks. They don't need sugary drinks. They need to get their calories through food. So teach them to drink water. Maybe with a little lemon in it, a little cucumber, some herbal teas with no sugar. Raspberry is really popular with kids. 
Snacks are not necessary if girls have had a chance to eat at home. So if you meet at 6 in the evening, they've had a couple of hours since they got out of school. You need to make it clear to the families that they should feed their child before they bring them to the meeting. They shouldn't expect you to be providing dinner for their child. Now some families have kind of crazy schedules and they may not normally have dinner until late in the evening. In that case, they should still have provided some kind of a snack for their child before they come to the meeting. If a girl arrives with food, ask her parent to sit with her in another area while she finishes it. You don't want her sitting in front of the rest of the troop eating a happy meal. It's, it's just a bad vibe for everybody. And if a girl in the group is hungry, she thinks she gets jealous, it's just not good. Find out if that's going to be a routine situation or a one-time occurrence and have a discussion with the parent if it needs to be a routine situation. Perhaps they can find a way to, you know, spend a few minutes sitting out in the car eating before they come in or shift their time a little bit or find another way to feed that child. You don't want the girl to be hungry. And of course, be aware of food allergies and confirm them with the parents. A child will sometimes tell you they're allergic to something just because they don't want to try it. Girl Scouts is a great place to learn to try new foods. One of my favorite things is teaching kids to eat something new. They'll often try something new at Girl Scouts that they would never try at home because at home they know how to sort of manipulate their family members but they're less likely to try and do that with you. And Girl Scouts is a great place to take risks, and this is a risk to them. So the main activity should take at least half the troop meeting time. That's what they're there for. You don't have to be an expert on something. You can bring someone in to work with the girls or demonstrate something. They don't have to be an approved volunteer to do that. If you bring in a guest to your meeting, the basic rule is they never get left alone with any girls. That's pretty easy to do, to, you know, supervise them. You don't have to worry about making them register or getting a background check or anything. Just make sure they're never left alone. Planning your meetings through the volunteer toolkit allows parents to see what you've got planned. And parents who know what you plan to do will often have resources to help you. They'll volunteer somebody that they know to help out, or they'll volunteer that they have some supplies that you could use. It works out really well when you let them know what you're doing. There's a lot of meeting ideas listed in the volunteer toolkit. And of course, you can set up your own in there too. Girls can help set the meeting schedule. Like I said earlier, either while you're working in the toolkit, they can watch what you're doing, or you can work it out on paper and then you can put it into the toolkit later. Keep your troop budget in mind when you're planning and make sure everyone agrees when and where the money is spent. Wow, your meeting's going great! Girls are excited and engaged and they're learning life skills without even realizing it. There's still about 15 minutes left to the meeting and a couple of the parents start arriving and their girls, you know, drop what they're doing, run across to mom to tell them how excited they are, what a good time they're having, and mom says, okay, you ready to go? You let them know that the meeting is not done and to please wait a few minutes. No girls can leave until the troop is done with cleanup. You do not want them to get in the habit of sneaking out before they have to clean up. And here's another cute little caper chart that's pretty flexible because you can move girls around easily on their magnets and you can uh, shift what you need to. Girls should do the cleanup, not the adults, especially not you, and especially not your daughter because she has to stay behind with you at the end of the meeting. Girls need to learn life skills, and that includes cleaning up their own and other people's messes. They need to feel useful and accomplished, and something as small as wiping down the table can do that. 
Kids love to help. Use a troop caper chart to assign the tasks so nobody thinks you're playing favorites or picking on them and they don't fight over who gets the broom, who gets the dustpan. Many hands make light work. Adults can give directions and constructive feedback, but they should not be doing any of the cleaning. Every girl should do some part of the cleanup. This is why that troop caper chart earlier did not have room to put specific girls onto the cleanup. Everyone was expected to do it. Treat the cleanup as something that you expect them to help with, not as a special favor that they're doing for you. And don't give rewards for the routine cleanup. If you do a special cleanup, like going in uh, one day and spending four hours intensively cleaning your scout hut or your meeting place, that's something you could give them a fun patch for. But they should not get rewards just for the weekly cleaning. I don't get rewards for cleaning my house every week. The place looks great! Parents are lined up and ready to reclaim their girls. And believe me, they're impressed that you got their daughter to sweep and wipe tables. You're still in control of the room. Let the parents know that they should sign out their daughter. This isn't required, but it's highly, highly recommended. If you get in the habit early on of having a sign-in and sign-out sheet and teach the parents that that's the rule, then you'll always know who that girl left with, even if you were distracted and talking to somebody else. And that's important. Girls are never allowed to just walk out of the building without an adult. The girls know that the meeting's not over, though, until the closing. That's a nice picture of a friendship circle. The girls have crossed their hands right over left, you have to kind of look around the circle and check and make sure that they got all their arms in the right positions because there's always kids that don't know right from left. And they make a wish. One girl makes the wish and she squeezes her right hand, which squeezes the hand of the girl next to her. Then it's that girl's turn. She makes a wish. She squeezes her right hand. And the wish travels around the circle silently. This is all silent. And then at the end, they all turn to the right and raise their arm over their head and everybody spins out of the circle together. It's a lot of fun. Use the closing as a final chance to remind girls and their listening parents what the troop talked about at today's meeting. Remind girls and parents of responsibilities such as permission slips that they need to bring back or snack duties for next week. Let the girls focus on their identity as troop sisters. That's why you do the, the wish in a moment of silence. The girls that are not making their wish, they're watching their sisters. They're watching the, the uh, expressions as the wish travels around the circle. They're tuning into each other. You can sing a final song such as Taps. That's a classic. You can do the friendship circle. You can ask random girls what they learned or what they enjoyed about the meeting. Again, a final moment to focus on each other. Everyone should leave feeling that they're really going to be missed until next week or the next meeting. So we had questions in the question log initially when we started from people that expressed that they wanted to really find out how to use their time efficiently and they wanted to know more about snacks. I hope that those questions have been addressed. If you have other questions, feel free to contact your support system. You have service unit team members that are there to help you, you have other volunteers, and you have plenty of staff that are available. If you need to, you can send an email or call the council. Send your email to info at gsdsw.org or call your local council person. Everybody is willing and ready to help you. I want to thank you for attending. I hope this has been useful. Feel free to go back and review sections and um, take notes. 
review it periodically if you feel like your troop meetings are starting to get a little chaotic or you're not feeling as effective as you want it to be. Again, it's not just for new leaders. And I hope you really enjoy your Girl Scout experience because when you enjoy it, then the girls are enjoying it and then it's having an impact on them. Thank you.